Uh, hi everybody, we're back after the summer uh, for another episode of Insiders. I actually lost track of how many episodes we've filmed so far. So it's episode Darren. Hey Darren, <laughs> how are you? Hello. How's it going? I'm good, thanks. Good. So just a little bit of, of intro. Um, I've actually read your words for um, quite a few years now and we've been in touch mostly through just emailing uh, over mm. the past few years. Uh, you're one of my favorite people when it comes to just make me think about important topics. Um, the ownership of data, uh, the usage of data and how to maximize ROI for artists, uh, the role of the streaming platforms, how they're helping, but at the same time, how they have a lot of control. Um, anyway, uh, you also have a gift first approach with this uh, daily newsletter that's called the Daily Digest that mm. you uh, are sending to, I don't know how many people right now, but I always feel like what you're writing on top of that newsletter is meant for me that day. Uh, usually the topics that people have been speaking that week. So I'm really, really happy to have you on the, sh on the show. I'll put a link on the newsletter and I hope more people can start to read your thoughts. Um, Thank you. That's kind well, of you. Really, my pleasure. Um, kind of as usual with people, I always try to understand where they come from and why they are doing what they are doing now. We work in such a specific industry and mm. people like you and I work in a subset of that industry. Uh, you do digital marketing, strategic uh, development, um, can you just explain very briefly what is Motive Unknown, which is your company today? Um, I mean, we're we're an agency that just try and exist to do smart work in a in in a, in and around kind of the digital strategy and marketing space. Um, you know, we grew from originally it was just me, you know, and I used to just do everything for campaigns. So. You know, anyone is bored of hearing me say it, but it was like, you know, started the company. First client was Alt J, which obviously went huge. Um, and within that, you know, I was looking after everything from paid marketing through to their social media, you know, the, the, the whole spread. I think as time's gone on and as the company's grown, we've, we've sort of diversified a bit more. And these days we, you know, we work with artists management directly. So we have some artist clients. We work with uh quite a lot of labels as well um and what we do for them tends to differ depending on what their needs are but it's broadly sort of strategy and business development to you know how can they do things better or smarter or more profitably things like that um and we're also doing an increasing amount of work around e-commerce now as well um because we just realized it was a space that was quite fertile for you know improvement um so we're doing quite a lot of work there too. But broadly, I mean, it's that. But I think we've always found it difficult to sort of crisply summarize what we do. And I think actually we kind of summarize it just as, you know, we're hired because we're quite smart. So we try and look <laughs> at stuff and say, how can we do this better? And, you know, I think if there's a consistent theme throughout what we do, it's that we, you know, we're, we're not really fans of like, oh, you do it this way because it's always been done that way. We're kind of very much like, let's look at it and just go, OK, with like a blank sheet of paper, let's just ignore everything about the music industry and its little constructs and how it works and just ask how how can we do the best thing with this, whatever that thing may be. Yeah, there's going to be um, I, I wanted to um, to talk about two specific type of campaigns of artists. Um, You've talked a bit about Run the Jewels and about their DIY approach. Uh, mm. I remember reading a few years ago um, one of those posts that made me think, and you were talking about ROI. It was a couple of years ago, so don't try crazy Facebook ads today if you don't know your, what you're doing. But you were talking about ROI on Facebook ads on merch mm. um, and how most people would see that as an investment, um, um, almost like a publicity thing to be visible, but you actually were calculating how many, how many pounds or dollars or euros you would spend and how much you would make back and uh, you yeah. had a positive ROI on, on some on some merch item which is a very unusual way to think about the music industry singles release playlist strategy um, yeah. and so maybe talk a little bit about their approach um, and then there is another campaign that you've worked on recently um, which is the Moby release uh, he had this album with this meditation app uh, he was linking different parts of his careers together, and you guys kind of brought it back, brought it into one campaign. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on, on those two approaches? Yeah, I mean, with Run the Jewels, the whole thing was just to tighten up the, you know, what they were doing with their merchandising. And, and you know, going back a few years, the idea of using conversion tracking to sort of understand, you know, the response of a person. So if they saw a post or an ad for our merchandise you know that they would click through and did they actually purchase it and if so 
what was the value of the item I purchased. That was that was sort of not something that really happened a lot back then, and it was something we we brought to the team, you know, to implement. And I mean, it's a great area to work in in that sense with e-commerce, and I think it's part of the reason we've really spent a lot of time in that since because unlike music, recorded music, that's just so unbelievably sort of vague in terms of what you earn from it. Um, you know, with e-commerce, there's usually only kind of one checkout point. You know, there's like one site with one checkout point, and therefore you're pushing everyone through the same doorway, and you can clearly, you know, examine what goes on with that. And so it, I think some of it was, was almost a laziness on our part in that sense of like, if I can prove conclusively that for every dollar you spend, you make at least 10 back, but often 15, 20, then, you you know, the, the, the managers of any band are going to look at that and just go, OK, well, then just keep spending money, you know, because if you if you if you just sit there and say, I'm turning this dollar into you know twenty dollars for you, then there's no discussion and there's no you know, there's there's no misunderstanding there. It's it's absolutely black and white what you're earning back. And so I think within those spaces, it's we find it quite a nice place to work just because it is genuinely that much easier. You know, and I think it's uh, it's it's very black and white and therefore very easy to establish value and all that kind of thing. So I think with Run the Jewels, it was it's since evolved into bigger conversations as to you know, how do we do this, but maintain a really high quality fan relationship? Because obviously, if, if you know, if you're not careful, you might, you know, keep producing too much merch because you're making money. And your sort of first thought is, well, if we get, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars back for every dollar we spend, just like, let's be greedy. Flood and the just market, keep, yeah, just of course. Go, go, go. And so it, it led to a lot of conversation, you know, good conversation about, you know, just because you can do it. It doesn't mean you should do it, and you have to really respect that fan relationship and understand that there's. I think it took us a a, a little while to sort of realise that all of this is a is a give and take. You know, in Run the Jewels case, it was like they give the album away for free. You know, and and all they always did. I mean, you know, fans can always got the record first, and they would be able to download it straight away, so they had it there and then. Um, and so that's the give. You know, and the take is then, yeah, so putting merchandise on sale or putting deluxe versions of the album on sale. But it always sits in balance. And, you know, if you overdo it on the take, take, take and you don't give, then you're going to piss fans off and, and lose them. So, you know, I think it's it, it led down a path that was really beneficial for for everyone in terms of learning that, you know, it's it's a relationship you have to maintain and be sensible about. You don't gouge fans you know you have to respect them that they are your supporters and you should nurture that relationship and you know avoid the desire to sort of just plunder them for as much money as you can and things like that so so yeah so i think in that space it's worked really well and it's led to us developing a lot more with run the jewels kind of means to yeah focus on that fan relationship and what can we do you think it was do you think it was um and you probably know that do you think from their from their point the first time they were starting to give music for free was it a calculated thing like well we're not going to sell a lot of cds but if you give the music for free and we get an email back eventually we'll be able to monetize that better than the actual music or was it a completely genuine thing like let's just give it away uh, see what happens and then they happen to monetize it is it a thought out process or is it more like a philosophical approach I mean, to be honest, I'm I'm not the guy to answer the question. Only because I got, I you know, Motive Unknown came on board with Run the Jewels kind of about halfway through the Run the Jewels two campaign. By which time, you know, there's a second album they're given away. I've seen interviews with LP where he said they actually they gave away the first album because I think they'd seen Danny Brown mm. do it with the Triple X record that he put out. And it was on the same label on Fool's Gold, Atrax label. And uh, and Danny just gave it away. And it was on sale and everything as well, but he just he just wanted as many people as possible to hear it, I think. And I think LP just really liked that approach. I mean, I and I can't speak as to what his motivation was, you know, because maybe there's an argument that The View was, well, we don't make much money from the recorded music bit anyway. I, I honestly don't know. So I'm not sure what his motivation was, but um, I, you know, I I kind of appreciate the boldness of it because I've been in many a meeting subsequent to that. I remember being at one at 
well, I won't name the label, but I kind of said in the meeting, you know, why don't we just give the record away? And I mean, the room just went, <laughs> the temperature of the room, just went, you know, it was a real like, uh, okay, may, maybe, or not, you know, <laughs> so I got left. Um, so even now, you know, if you were to talk about the, the, the bold move of just giving something uh, like that, you know, it, it would get met with frosty stares. So I kind of, I'd always appreciated the way that the band and the, and the management had gone about this, you know, and I think that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Run The Jewels anyway. I'm sort of notorious for being the fanboy on the team, which is a, a blessing and a curse at points. I'm sure I irritate the shit out of the management a lot of the time for that reason. But, um, you, you know, they, I just always admired them as a group and their music, but I also admired their approach because it looked like they didn't really weren't intending to follow just the the, the 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 framework and the parameters that the music industry has set up for them you know they were kind of like no and even we run the jewels three you know i remember people phoning me up saying you've got to talk them out of giving it away because it's going to piss off spotify and it will it will ruin a relationship with apple music and 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 the, you know and the, i was like you know you're going to say that because that's the space you work in and you need this to stream loads and everything else but there's a way that this will work that doesn't involve doing that. And if that burns a couple of bridges along the way, then we're fine with that because the only people this band is answerable to are their fans. You know, and it yeah. kind of speaks to this whole thing that drives me crazy about, you know, labels and, and people generally in the music business kind of marketing for the platform and, you know, going, well, we have to run ads to drive people to Spotify. It's like, no, no, you don't. You have to market a band. Fuck where they're listening to it. I don't care. You know, as long as they're into it and they're buying into it, then it's it's great. So I suppose that leads nicely onto things like the Moby deal. Um, you know, Moby had made his second album of ambient music. He'd, he'd done the first one and we actually worked on that as well. And we did a deal with WeTransfer to give the album away for free. And WeTransfer absolutely hammered hell out of it. And that got about a million downloads. So that was kind of cool. Um, and when the second record came what, along... What was that? It was the We Transfer huge splash page. Uh, so every time people were getting lints, they would get the big Moby ad and then they would just yeah, click through and get it. Yeah, that was it. Because um, at the time, I think that, you know, it was a bit more rushed and stuff like that. But when the second record came around, Long Ambience 2, you know, my colleague Tom was looking at it and, you know, Moby owns the album. It's his own, you know, label and, and everything else. So not unlike Run the Jewels, you know, he's... He's everything in one, you know, in terms of the artist and the label and, and what have you. So he had absolute freedom to do what he wants with it. And I remember me and Tom sitting there and I'd, I'd been sort of ranting about the futility of trying to compete in this noise to get Spotify's attention. For, you know, coverage and feedback and stuff like that. And it just bores me. You know, it's not. You, you're getting in a queue with a thousand other people <clears throat> and we'd been looking at these meditation apps for a while and we realized that calm had 45 million users and it had music in there but it was all like production sort of new agey music it it wasn't great and i'm you know i used the calm app as well so what was, was it like it was production music it wasn't artist yeah yeah background yeah, so just, music yeah 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 it's just some music that presumably bought you know and, and everything else so yeah we just it kind of it just sort of spun out from there you know it was a sort of why not uh shop the ambient record i think it was tom that eventually sort of was like you know we'd be i think we've been looking at calm and headspace and these sorts of apps over here and then mobu's over there and i think it was tom that kind of was like hang on if we if we put these two together you know moby was totally sort of fine with that because the reach of it was just so much greater and he would he was you know the first you know proper artist on on that platform so it really kind of kicked open the door to you know to do more with them and we we have done more since with Sigur Ross um we're doing something with another artist now and I know above and beyond have also done something with them too um but I mean you know stats wise it got uh, about three million listens from the in the opening couple of weeks, uh, forty one million minutes of listening time. Um, the really interesting thing was the demographics were in no way sort of matching Moby's audience. We know what Moby's audience is, but the certainly the the listeners on Calm were like seventy percent female, 
and stuff like that. So it's nice was, from the from them that they would send you back the data uh, on some kind of listening pattern. So I was thinking, if the album was not on Spotify and other platforms, usually you try to you can kind of see who listens to the music. If you're mm-hmm. giving your album away to a meditation app, uh, then they have the data, and I'm guessing they're sending it to you in a very not a manual way, but not the way at like Spotify for artists. They're not made for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. They did, you know, do their research on it. And, you know, so, I mean, I've got the report here and it's saying, you know, the primary goal of listeners listening to the long ambience was to sleep better, which was, you know, that's kind of basically what the record was, was there to assist with. And, you know, the primary listening time tellingly was between like 9 p.m. and 8 a.m. So it was very much that's, people yeah. putting it on to nod off and stuff like that. But that, you know, it, it just, it, there's this whole thing, like, you know, there's a great um, marketing guy called Dave Trott, who's written these books about creative thinking and stuff like that. And it was like, ironically, it was after we'd done the Moby deal, but I remember reading his book and he was kind of saying, you know, smart marketing is where you swim upstream to where it's quieter to get to get space to be noticed. And I think that's exactly what we did with Moby. It was like, instead of trying to go to Spotify, where all the music is to get focus and attention we swam upstream to where calm was with 45 million people and they you know they emailed 40 million people to tell them that this app was there you know it was on the front page it was covered in about 50 outlets i think they said the impressions on that content alone for the announcement was like a hundred million or something you know i mean this is all you know you would you would cut off your arm for that kind of coverage on any album release so it you know it's it, uh, it worked really well and it was just by not accepting that your only path to market is through standard DSPs. You know, it's sitting there and going, okay, outside of that, what's over here? You know, what else can we look at? And and it's it's something we're continuing to do. Was it a, a time thing? Like, is it not, is the album now on all the DSPs, or was, is it a permanent exclusive or long term? <clears throat> no, it was it was exclusive for a month. Oh, now it's on all the DSPs and everywhere else. Um, and it had a solid halo effect, you know, in terms of charting on Billboard and stuff like that. And I mean, you know, it's it's a long, it's about five hours long. You know, it's it's I think you know it's it's a very long album, and it, you know each track is about forty minutes. So by a kind of standard definition, it's it's not an accessible record. Do you know what I mean? It's not the Ed Sheeran album of you know nice three minute pop collaborations. It, yeah. So it was it, it 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 was a different type of release, but. I don't know. We, I mean, we've been continually fascinated by this sort of <clears throat> development of ambient music, which traditionally has been a pretty unsellable genre, I think, you know, and now it's kind of found purpose and use. And it's one of the more interesting sort of developments of the world of streaming is, mm. you know, people it's like Max. Yeah, st- streaming as a whole um, and actually on the platforms themselves, um, um, contextualized playlists like focus, sleep, meditation, work. And so there is the Calm app is is in the same uh, vein, trying to find music that fits those things and not library music. I think people are still uh, pretty conscious that when they listen to Moby's music, it's a little bit better than <laughs> the, yeah. most of the production music out there. One of the things that um, the album is definitely not geared to is a short songs to generate um, stream royalty. Uh, songs are getting shorter and shorter. If you had a five hour album with very long songs, uh, even financially, it makes more sense to try to get people to listen to the music as much as possible in a meditation app, uh, probably getting paid some kind of lump, variable, but not a paid per stream. And it allows yourself to have extremely long songs and potentially people listening one track for an hour, which is the same as you would get for um, you know, a 20 track album of three minutes or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, so- it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think you know, I mean, I put an article in the Digest yesterday about how streaming generally may be negatively affecting. I mean, they can, it was in Resident Advisor and it was contextualized in as sort of electronic music. But I think in truth, it's probably all music where, you know, just saying that it's the it's the, dan- the damage to the broader culture that's problematic here. And, the, and things like the very short attention span of listening is sort of steering consumption away from those long epic you know techno songs that are 10 minutes long and stuff like that and i'm just curious you know whether there will be this sort of migration of of those sorts of artists to things maybe not like calm but in similar spaces that would make you know long music more tolerable or you know acceptable because the context for it 
you know that you're putting it on to fall asleep so obviously you're not looking to flick through stuff you you're wanting it to be a 10 you know 20 30 60 minute song almost um so yeah I don't, you know i'm curious to see how that will evolve but um i feel like with the with the calm stuff you know it was the right music in the right place and i think for moby as an artist uh you know it it felt successful to me you know i'm very conscious i'm not moby and i can't speak for moby so you know but i i feel like it did a lot more than if we'd have gone a traditional route to marketing that album that's for sure yeah definitely a good fit for this artist um i was surprised but you know it's one of those things you're like ha huh. and then by the end of the sentence you're like oh yeah that makes sense yeah um, yeah for sure um so the um i'm actually going to go back a bit to uh, trying to get some info on, on who you who you are uh, before motive but now that we're on motive i started started this interview with the wrong questions uh uh, so now that we're on Motive, I realize you're also working with uh, handful brands, some tech startups. You, I read you were uh, helping the Beth Dido uh, like fashion launch, the, the launch of her fashion brand. Uh, mm. Could you give us some context on non-music campaigns and how they are different? Is this something that you were uh, trying to get just to have a bit more oxygen and uh, something fresh? It, it just came to you and it gives you another perspective. Um, yeah, sh share some insights I mean, on this. So most of the stuff we've done that's sort of not music tends to have some kind of abstract connection back you know so with beth ditto it's you know it's beth ditto, beth ditto. and we know, we know her managers and they kind of i think we i'd had lunch with them because they're just friends of ours and uh had been talking about what we'd achieved with run the jewels and the roi on their merch and so they kind of came back to us when the when beth's uh, fashion line was launching so well could you help with this you know set it all up so we can understand what money's being made because i, I mean who wouldn't want <laughs> kind of solid sense of return on investment when you're spending money you know it's it's everybody's kind of dream um so we took it on just because it was something a bit different um and since then we've kind of dabbled around with things like headphone brands and um we work with rough trade shops at the moment um you know so we're we, we've explored different spaces, but they sort of all have a some kind of loose connection back to music, you know, so the product is a music product or whatever, you know, it's retailing music in some capacity. Um, but I think at its heart, to be honest, it was mainly because they just used to come to us and we quite fancied a different challenge. I mean, the one that we had, we kind of had fun with it, even though it was not the most effective, was working with CBD oil. Um, like a company that made CBD oil. Is that legal but in the UK? CBD is legal, yeah. yeah. But it was sort of like we like a challenge. <laughs> so there was this thing of like, how do you market products when there's so much sensitivity around the product? So in the States, there was, you know, Facebook wouldn't touch it. And, but I quite like things like that. You know, I'm, I, I. What do you I, mean? Like Facebook is banning any ad that if you put CBD artwork and stuff it just gets banned yeah you can't you know but also they know where you're linking to so even if the, the ad is vague and you link through to a cbd page it, oh. it you know it can cause issues but there was you know and then it would there was experiments on our side as to whether you can run ads that simply don't use the term cbd and refer to it as hemp oil and things like that um but then in doing it we discovered that there were like whole networks of like marijuana advertising so there are like TV based advertising and stuff throughout California and other places where it's legal. And it, I don't know, it was just, it, yeah, stuff like that always fascinates me. You know, I think I'm quite a contrarian at heart. So when everyone's running to Instagram to spend money, I'm the guy at the back sort of being like, okay, well, where else can we put our money here? Cause I, I'm also not really, you know, we're sort of known as digital people, but, you know, if Run the Jewels can achieve more by spending money on posters, you know, on the tube or any, anywhere else or whatever, then we'll do that. You know, I don't care. It's it's about impact and growing something. And I'm not particularly obsessed with it having to be digitally based. It's just whatever gets the best result. So I think with those non sort of non recorded music or non kind of artist type uh, clients that we work with, they just present a very different view of the world and i think that's really healthy you know and i quite like that we maintain a few of these because it, it gives you balance and i think music has a terrible the music industry has a terrible 
<clears throat> tendency to sort of only hire people who've been in the music industry. And uh, and it, it's created a monstrous kind of echo chamber. And it was, really, you know, when um, Matt Cheatham joined Motive Unknown in January last year, his background prior to that had been with like uh, World Duty Free, you know, all the duty free shops and all the airports around the world, which is like a nine billion dollar a year business or something. Um, and prior to that, he'd been at Mother Care selling baby clothes and things like that. And I knew Matt because actually peeling back prior to all of that, he ran a service called Samurai FM that was a, a dance music streaming site in about the year 2001, you know, predated Spotify and things like that. Um, but Matt came in with this completely fresh perspective. And it's been kind of funny because even to this day, there's these points where we'll go, oh, we're going to do this. And Matt's looking at it going, well, why? Because <laughs> like, from his perspective, like it just makes no sense at all. And sometimes it's, you know, you have to, it, it's basically like, well, yeah, I know it makes no sense, but that's how it's done. Deal with it. But there's been a lot more instances where it's prompted us to be like, yeah, he's kind of got a point. You know, why? Why are we doing this? You know, why go that route? It doesn't make any sense at all. And it, and again, it speaks to this thing of, you know, just look at different ways of doing stuff. Just don't accept the, the the things that are in front of you. So I think the non-music clients that we maintain, although there's a, probably less of them at the moment, um, they just give us a sense of balance and a, just a bit more of a real world thing, you know, that, that is, I think, really healthy. Is the... Is the main difference the fact that when you do uh, when you do marketing on Al J or on the Jewels or, or Moby, you're essentially touching an artist, and m you might have a positive ROI, but sending the same message as an ad to a consumer who happens to be a fan might be too much and might might uh, alienate him. Where if you're selling a headphones brand or CBD oil, uh, if one consumer sees an ad too much and just dismisses the ad. Um, that's not the end of the world. And so you're more focused on the ROI and, 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 and making revenue than trying to find the right revenue slash good karma type uh, thing. You're it allowed to be a push, push, push it more. Yeah, I mean, I think what we learned with working with headphone brands and even with the CBD oil was something that we've since kind of brought back to working on with music. And it took us a long route to get there. But We realized, particularly with headphones, it's such a congested market, you know, it's painfully kind of overcrowded, that what you needed to do was tell a story as to why your product was better or more worthy of attention than someone else's. But with such short attention spans on social media, you can't do that in like one long ad. It's not like, here's a five minute video explaining why our headphones are awesome. It's like, you have about 15 seconds, yeah, yeah. tops. So you have to tell the stories in sequences, you know, and, and once we know you've engaged with story number one, you know, we'll deepen it with story number two. And when we know we've got you on that, so, you know, you, and you build that up. And it, I think in music, there was a, a real point where everyone, us included, was just being very lazy and being like, yeah, the new album by Blah is out now. Click here. And you go through like a to a pivot page, whether it's Smart URL or Linkfire or Feature FM or whomever. And that was it. You know, and you were just going, yeah, here's the album, but listen now. And it took us a little while of analyzing all these results to realize that people just don't do that. And that even when we were landing people on a Linkfire page for like six pence per click, the cost of actually putting them from the pivot page to Spotify rarely dropped below a few pounds. You know, they just people never did it. They just bounced and, you know, the, it, it, it just amounted to a really bad use of your money. So we created a presentation, which I've still not made public, which I should because I've sent it to a bunch of people, but I never post it publicly, even though I said in the digest that I would at some stage. But in that presentation, we're basically just saying, you know, you need to engage people with native media, partly to work around GDPR in, in Europe as well. So, you know, on Facebook and Twitter, where people have agreed to see these things, it's much easier to show them ads. But, you know. You're pushing media that just t that tells that story and, and gets people connected with the artist and isn't as kind of crass as to just be like, here's my band, listen now. You know, cause it, and I always liken it to kind of if you're walking down the street and, you know, let's just say you're en route to meet me to do this podcast and you're walking down the street and someone steps out from behind a lamppost and goes, hey, do you want to listen to the new Run the Jewels record? And you might be like, You know, generally, I think the response, I mean, I live in London and we, you know, it's like most built up places, we take this view, but it's kind of like, even if I'm a fan, you'd be like, I mean, yeah, but not now. Like I'm going somewhere, I've 
you know, mentally, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm into it, but no, I don't want to stop right now and listen to Run the Jewels. Whereas if when you're walking down the street, you're just getting snippets of Run the Jewels all the way, you're hoping that later in the day, you'd be like, yeah, I should put that Run the Jewels record on because, mm-hmm. you know, I saw this bit and that bit and I kind of, you know, I've soaked that in now and it's stuck in my head. And I think that's the difference. You know, it's and and if I had a penny for every time we dealt with labels who've just been like, yeah, can we just run ads going, listen now. And fucking Spotify telling people to run ads being like, you know, we've put your song on a playlist. And now if you run ads, we'll put your song at number one. And I'm looking at going, this this is just an ad for Spotify's playlist. This isn't even an ad for the band. You know, this is (laughs) criminal. And so the number of rants that people have had from me being like, Look, you know, I'm sure Spotify are telling you that they'll probably never playlist you again or something if you don't do their marketing for them. But there's something really insidious about spending money to drive people to a platform that, you know, they should be running their own marketing. Do you know what I mean? They should be paying you to run, you know, a bit like in the days of the Apple Music marketing thing where they go, here's some money. Run yeah. some ads and drive, but it drives people to us. I don't. Like, I don't actually think payment. that. I don't actually know that. Um, I still manage a band who is fairly like doing fairly well on Spotify. They've never asked us. Uh, I think it's a lot of FOMO. It's if you're you, you have a fear of missing out as a professional. Like it's more like shit. If mm. I don't push that playlist, the next time I see Spotify, there's going to be this kind of feeling in the room like they know that I didn't push it. But in reality. I've never had a Spotify rep tell me, oh, you didn't sponsor that post about that chill electronic playlist. It's more about you coming in a meeting and saying, hey, Spotify, did you see how I sponsored that post? And they're like, oh, thank you. That's nice. But it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing for them to ask. And I think people, a lot of professionals are putting themselves in a situation of just doing that spontaneously when nobody has mm. asked for them. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I've seen a lot of those posts, like so happy to be in this playlist. Click here and you click and it's actually the playlist um but yeah it's, i think it's a lot of the fomo it's a lot of sending that ad to spotify saying look how i'm talking about the platform hoping oh, yeah. that they're happy and it's it's more uh, wishful thinking than um than um yeah reacting to something the platform would ask but, but of but course i think it goes back to what i was saying though isn't it where it's like you just have to market your artist and have faith you know just i mean and i think some of the biggest artists have blown up because they're just doing their thing and I think, weirdly, platforms like Spotify gravitate to them harder almost because of the FOMO in the opposite direction where Spotify going, well, you know, this guy's getting huge or this artist, this lady, this band, whomever, you know, we don't seem to be doing anything with them. So let's go to them. But, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that all that whole view is a real cancer on the marketing of the music business where it's like market your artist just that it's a brand you have to build a brand and i suppose that's i guess the learnings we took from working on brands is you're building a brand and you're building an allegiance to that brand and that's kind of what you're doing in music as well for sure um i don't think people love i mean a lot of people like the songs but bob marley michael jackson james brown um like metallica they represent so much more than a few songs uh, to the hardcore fans for sure um, oh, I don't. I mean, Metallica are like I'm. I'm a bit of a stalker of Metallica at the moment. Um, I mean, they are very commercialized now, but you kind of have to admire <laughs> the game they're running. I mean, I I think it's like they do go a little bit far. I'm on their mailing list, and I, I genuinely I recommend people join their mailing list because it's quite an interesting exercise in how they. Um, manage a balance of like fan give and take and stuff like that but they've done so many things I went to see them in London uh, this summer and they did some just they just understand the little things that make the difference like the beer cups were branded Metallica plastic beer cups oh when you got a beer when you got a beer at the venue yeah yeah so it it had the and justice for all writing and just said and beers for all or something like that And, and like of course all the fans are like hoarding the cups and leaving with them um but also they had guys going around giving younger fans in the audience, which in my case is my 12 year old son, like branded Metallica plectrums. And they were just like roadies going around, just handing out like, big, you know, here's a few. And it had like Metallica London and the date and it blew my son's mind. And I'm, I'm forever fascinated when you see how much impact that has on a child, you know, to be given this stuff. And he's like, <gasps> and it's like a massively treasured thing because, it, you know, I mean, they are quite rare, you know, they're not really, they were for that one day and they weren't, 
you couldn't buy them. They were only being given out. So they kind of carry that rare value. Yeah. They're creating but, you know, fans. Truth, That's... Yeah, a branded plectrum, it's no cost at all. It's pennies, you know, but the goodwill that you parlay from that by just giving them away is stuff like that where, you know, and even at the end of the show, Big Union Jack with the Metallica Loves London or something on it as everyone's leaving. And I remember being on the phone to run the Jules Manager, just going through all this, going, these are the little things. And it's just the little things that create so much goodwill. And you have to look at this stuff because you've just got to admire it, you know. So, yeah, look, I mean, like I said, Metallica, definitely very commercial, you know, and they use Salesforce because they're, they're friends with the guys at Salesforce. So they use a, a CRM package that no artist could yeah, afford because sure. it's like ten thousand dollars a month or something but yeah i just i'm, I'm always looking at them with a, a it's it's very interesting to learn what they yeah for, for this sure. stuff you look at and admire and apply you know in pieces to your own work it's the only concert i slept in the street trying to buy a ticket to um <laughs> i was i mean it was a long time ago i was 20 less than 25 it was 10 years ago um and it's crazy. They, uh, they came back with Saint Anger, I think it was. And I'm not the biggest Metallica fan in the world, but uh, my brother-in-law, my sister's boyfriend at the time, was a huge fan. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go see Metallica. He's like, well, they're playing three shows in the same day. They're playing a 200-people venue, a 600-people venue, and then they're playing their, like, 12,000, whatever they're doing. And I was mm. like, fuck the 12,000. I'm going to see the 100 people venue. Where should, like, how am I getting those tickets? He's like, well, the kick, like, you have to sleep in front of that place in order for, to get the tickets. And I remember that whole evening. Um, so I was like, I don't know, 15, 16. Now maybe, tw yeah, maybe 21, maybe 20. Um, in the street with this metal head. My sister's boyfriend was like this metal guy, older than me. And there was a bunch of people outside. And obviously you could tell nobody was going to get a ticket. There was maybe a you know, thousand people outside that ticketing 200 people would get the ticket it was such a party and a communion effect people went to the venue all together only 200 people got in and then the rest stayed outside and during the entire show they were like you know doing metallica stuff all together talking talking probably about the big stadium show they were going to go see at the end of the day and there's a sense of community uh for a worldwide band uh, almost like the star wars people you know when you go see your star yeah. wars premiere and you're like i, th I think metal has got that down like sure. the whole heavy metal world has got that kind of you know fraternal thing going on it's very inclusive mm. and lovely there's and i a, always love it when i'm at a metal gig to see that there is a company called gimme radio I'll, I'll send you a link to and they do um online radio but created by metal um artists so they have dave mustaine and a few of the megadeth and and other mm. artists and it's um it's basically a curated radio uh, that uh, creates a community. So the fans are talking with the talk show hosts. The talk show hosts are artists themselves. They're inviting one another. Um, mm. Very, very interesting way of listening to music. Uh, now they're actually generating Spotify playlists. So when you listen to the station, you can kind of bridge other to your more lean back experience. Uh, but yeah, Metal allows you to do community-based marketing or, um, um, that other genres don't allow. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think with all of that, the one thing I would say, just to finish it on the Metallica thing, was they also really have that understanding of give versus take. Like at every, at every date they're playing, they're filming the whole thing, and they've been posting the set like one or two songs at a time from each date on YouTube. So you can pretty much see the whole tour by the end of it. You know, you'll have a sense of every single concert, all pro shot, all in HD, and all put on YouTube for nothing. You know, and it's little things like that, again, where it's like, as I said, you have to manage a give versus take. So I think in giving those little things, Metallica earned the right to then say, oh, we've done a, you know, a Metallica watch with Nixon. And, you know, it's like $120 or whatever, you know. And, I, yeah, I just think they seem to have a real sense of it. And I'm sure someone might be listening to this going, yeah, well, obviously, you know, the Metallica and the, you know, they've got millions. And doubtless that's true. But I think the principles underlying it. Are exactly the same if you were playing in a pub and you, you're not signed yet you know just understand that you give a little to get a lot back you know and you can i remember lp saying this on a phone call actually once it was you know he, he has an absolute belief that you can be the better person and still you know make a living make good money you, you know you in, in the world you know you can there, there is a balance you can find there of like doing the right thing, being a good person, behaving responsibly and earning a good living as well. You know, and I think 
it was great to hear him say that because I kind of feel the same way with with Motive Unknown. I don't run my company like an asshole. You know, I run it as you know as as equitably as I can to the point where we have a, a profit share in the company that you know we have a good year. Everyone gets some of the profit, you know, and, and all that kind of thing. So it's it's important. <laughs> you know, values count for something. You you were talking earlier. I'll I'll switch gear a little bit. We, you were talking earlier a bit about how we all talk in an echo chamber. Um, we we've known each other without knowing each other. Uh, there's probably 20 people we can name you and I that we both know that we've never really met, but we know that we know them. It's a very small mm. world. It feels very big, but it's not. Um, mm. And we um, we have a sense of putting pressure. There, we're always running late, doing too much, uh, saying yes to too many projects. Um, and um, Dave Emery, um, who was at Cobalt at the time, I think, uh, yeah. who's now at Apple. Um, mm. And you, so one, you had a, an amazing podcast that I used to listen, which was you and Dave talking around beers. Um, um, so yeah, anyway, and so that was discussion without filters. And that discussion led to a lot of thinking. He, he had a, a point of view about burnout, well-being, um, it was at the beginning of the Me Too movement, so that kind of transferred also into talking about overall respect and decency in the industry. Um, you then did a panel about, I think, a year ago, a year after the, those texts. Um, the, the, the world is evolving very, very quickly. There is still the, now this Epstein thing, the Weinstein documentary. Um, mm. Can we talk a little bit together about well-being, burnout, uh, trying to do your best, trying to work in a... In a, in a vertical that is very, very hard to get in and the sense that you need to give 200%. And also maybe we can talk a bit about respect and well-being and uh, um, how uh, maybe as Ben we can make, the, um, uh, make it easier for women to, to thrive in this industry. Uh, yeah, two I mean, kind of different topics, but they always kind of overlap. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the well-being thing was rooted in you know, my own experiences as much as anything else where I kind of in, you know, a cu cu couple of years, three years into running Motive Unknown, maybe. Um, it was about five or six years ago. I kind of started having anxiety attacks and then had like full on, you know, depression problems and, and everything else, which I don't really speak about. And the whole time I've talked about well-being, I've not really talked about it, partly because I don't I don't think my own personal experience needs to be discussed in that way you know I, it, I, yeah it just it, it's not necessary i suppose but it, it was motivated from that and um you know when david originally wrote an article kind of saying you know there's a lot more of this than we all realize and it's it's just not right um but, you know part, part of the you know the one of the people being referenced, I suppose, was me because he, he and I have been friends for a, a long time, you know, back from when he was at Beggars and stuff. And, uh, you know, he knew that I've been having problems because originally when we were doing the podcast, I remember phoning him up and saying, I can't do the show because I'm just I'm like having a full on freak out, expecting David to be like, uh, wow, that, you know, that sounds awful. And he just replied going, oh, yeah, I've had that. And I was like, oh, and it kind of diffused the situation a bit because his view you know he was just like yeah no i remember you know and so he was talking about his experiences and that's what kind of led to us realizing that you need to call this stuff out a bit more um and i think you know part of the reason i i'm i'm quite uh honest and open about a lot of stuff is that i think most people work at businesses that wouldn't um, allow them to speak openly and freely um you know, and, and you can't just kind of say, yes, I, I, this is how I feel, because the, your business, your employer might say, you, you know, you can't speak like that. You mean that. In, the other, in other industry like finance or? No, I mean in the music business oh, yeah. generally. I mean, you know, and even, you know, well, every business is quite careful about that stuff. But it means that people don't feel they can speak out and it becomes quite difficult. And I think it's uh, it's very hard. So. On the well-being thing, I think in the in the music industry, I think it's a it's a broader problem anyway, and it's a symptom of a twenty four seven sort of device culture and things like that. But I think particularly in the music business, we 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 are more guilty than any other industry I've experienced. And I you know I co-own a, a construction company as well as running Motive Unknown, and so you know I've got insight and experience of businesses outside of music, um, and within all of that, 
you know, the music business just kind of runs itself incredibly badly. You know, it just it, it just doesn't work well. You know, and if you had someone come in from outside the music business and look at a lot of organizations, they'd just be like, the fuck are you doing? You know, why is this? Why do you think this is a smart and good way of of working? You know, and so there are two sides to this. The first is that it's just it's just bad. You know, it just shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't accept to normalize when people are struggling, you know, when they're going home and they can't function. You know, I remember somebody telling me that he went on holiday and spent half the holiday with his family hiding in, in the bedroom, kind of obsessively looking at his phone at the time, trying to deal with work emails because he just couldn't disconnect from work. And, it, you know, he didn't have a holiday and he almost had a nervous breakdown in, in the process. And you're just like, that's just fucking wrong. <laughs> you know, and that's just that is wrong. And if as a business you're doing that to your staff, you've got it wrong. So I think we have to call that stuff out. And I think whilst to some extent there's been improvements, I don't actually think it's improved that much. I think the number one observation of mine through the years since that all happened with us calling this out is that a lot of people have paid lip service to it and said, oh, you know, we care about well-being. And it's like, you don't. You just don't there's no evidence that you actually do it's, it's like changing company say, values yeah changing company values putting them on the door yeah and it doesn't make any it. odds and i think my my chief observation in that is that unless this absolutely bleeds through the company from the top the very top down nothing will change so somebody at the top has to go i'm running this and i don't accept that working you know 60 hours a week is a norm you know, then unless that happens, it just doesn't work. Because what you find is that you'll get a poor HR person even who's trying to do this, but with basically with bosses who don't care. And so they're never really going to be able to do anything meaningful when the people above them, their bosses, don't give a shit, you know, and are just, I want the best result and I don't care how we get it. So I think it's still a huge problem. And there's a lot of evidence that, you know, we're still seeing this. And I, I do worry because, and I've written about it in the past where it's like as, you know, things like label services companies, they're having to become quite a high volume model now. And we've sort of done it to ourselves in the sense that the power shifted to the artists and it's made the label services companies have to do really, really slim deals because the artist is now going, well, it's, it's a buyer's market. I can cherry pick from whoever I want. I don't need any of you, in my view. So they're doing these slim deals, but it means they have to do more of them. And in doing more of them, it means the staff have to look after more and more and more of these projects. And then the staff start to struggle. You know, they can't take this. They, and, you know, the balance of what the business needs to draw in and what it's able to afford by way of staffing is, can be a bit off, you know. And, and so I think there's new problems developing that will challenge this even more. And I think it's, you know, it's a it's a bit of a crass analogy, but you know, I think if you're an alcoholic, you it's something you live with every day. You're an alcoholic, and you have to avoid alcohol. You know, you don't just get, it's, you're not cured and you walk away. It's something you manage actively every day. And I think in terms of well-being, there's there's a, a, a similarity of sorts that you don't just go, oh, we've stuck a piece of paper on the wall saying we care about your well-being. Tick. You know, it doesn't work like that. It has to be constantly monitored and. You know, within my own company, and it's is working well, but it's it's not easy. It's a very difficult thing to manage. I have to say, as a, as, as a person who owns and runs a business, it is difficult. And mine is only a small business, so I'd imagine at scale it is it is very hard. Yeah, but it I think has it, to I be. Think it has to come from the top. That's that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, it has to bleed through. And, and I mean, you know, the, the running joke in my company is that the person that struggles most with well-being is probably me, because I'm actually quite bad at managing myself. So I'm very good at saying to everyone else, "This is how we need to be," but then I don't tend to listen to it and suffer accordingly. But so that's the well-being side. And then I think, as regards just generally behaving like a fucking decent human being and not treating women like shit, um, I don't just. <laughs> I, I, it's a strange thing for me. I think I've, it goes it goes further than uh, behaving like a pig. It it it's the little things like um, like for example pay difference. It's very very yeah. hard to know in a company if really the women are getting paid less and has it been fixed. Like there's maybe what three people at the company who would know the CFO, the HR, and the CEO. And if you're mm. in a 300 people business, you might have doubts and. Uh, hunches that women are getting paid less, but it's actually very hard one to pin to, to pin down, 
and 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 then to change i i don't know a single company like none of my friends have told me oh i work in a business where all the women have been reevaluated 10 percent because they were all paid 10 percent less and i'm sure mm. that's the case i'm sure there's a lot of businesses where 90 percent of the women are 10 percent less they could literally take all the women and say you all get a a pay raise. I don't know a single company who's done that. So it's very mm. hard to understand in the fine prints. There's the obviously don't be a pig, uh, minimum respect, but that's more like jail card, like, you know, you're out. And yeah, then there is yeah. the, the, fine, the fine print, the thing that, uh, the, you know, uh, feeling discomfort if you're, uh, you know, one one in an elevator because of a look or, um, and I think that is really the, 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 the problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's it's a funny one. It's it's a tricky area, and I think at the moment the the, the problem of like you, it seems like we've lost an ability to have a a kind of nuanced debate about these things. You know, we live in a very polarized world now, where just saying the wrong thing will sort of bring down the wrath of everything and everyone upon you. Um, and I've kind of fallen foul of that before on Twitter, where I've made a remark and and with what I thought was sort of positive, and then just got lynched for it. And you just hit this thing of like, uh, you know. I just won't say anything, you know, and, and I mean, you don't need to anyway, let's be honest, I don't need to air my views on Twitter, it's not necessary, it's like, go and do something, you know, and action stuff. And in that respect, I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I mean, you know, I remember we had this, like, within my business, we hit this point where I was saying, look, we're all men, we need to balance this up, it's not good as for us as a team. But even then, it was like, in the end, the person we wound up hiring was a guy, but the reason we wound up hiring him was because he was, he wasn't just slightly better than the other applicants. It was like, we'd have had to have been stupid to not hire him because he was just so unbelievably brilliant. And he is, and he continues to be, and he's been promoted and given, you know, a couple of pay rises and he's only been with us 18 months because he's that good. You know, he's amazing. Um, but it's hard because I, you know, I think that, and it's something I remember me and David Emery talking about where he saw it differently to me, where it, I've always worked around, you know, my whole career, I owe it to women who, who have brought me up through that, you know, and there's been incredibly strong, brilliant women that I've worked around. So, you know, Pat Carr, infectious at the time, hired me to work on Ultra. You know, it was Claire Britt at Pias who said to me, look, if you start your own company, you know, I'll let you go on Friday. You don't have to work a three month notice period. I'll let you go on Friday and you come back on Monday, but you're freelance working three days and then you can build your business. And there's all these women throughout, you know, and continues to be whether it's, you know, Rihanna at Because, who's running Because for, for the UK or Xena at Partizan, who I used to work with on Run the Jewels and is now MD at Partizan. There are fucking amazing women working all through the, the, the working world that I inhabit. So it's a sort of funny one because I look at it sometimes and I think, you know, there's there's brilliant people out there, but I don't recognize them and go, oh, they're great women. They're just really brilliant people. And I think the difference me and David had was on the sort of positive discrimination thing of like, should I hire someone who's sort of less able for the job because they're female versus hiring the best person for the job. And it, I just think it's a really difficult area to negotiate. I think one thing I would say is that our learning from working around digital marketing um, was that there's not really enough women sort of coming into it. You know, and even now when we hire, we'd be very lucky to get many applications at all from women in this space. And I, I don't know if, you know, I think perhaps there's different uh, things within any industry that might gravitate sort of gender wise, you know, they may, it's like, I remember talking to um, my friend Sam at, at BMG about this. And he was saying that the digital team at BMG, the guys doing the same stuff I do, they're all men, but the marketing team above it, who are the sort of non-digital, but product managers, and all that, it's all women. And we were sort of looking at it going, well, is it just a, a sort of natural division or, you know, why is that? Um, but I would like to see more women in digital marketing. And I've talked to people before about, you know, whether there's things we could do to develop it more. Um, because I just feel like one big problem, you know, I've said before, the biggest problem with the music business is that it's a bit of an echo chamber. And I think you run the same risk if you have a business that's just comprised of like white men, you know, and stuff like that. And I think the more of a mix you can bring in, uh, the more experience. I mean, it, there's ironies to all of this. The irony of the well-being discussion is that, if people are happy and healthy, they'll do much better work for you. They'll just deliver more. 
and you'll get much more from them as, as employees. And I think it's the same as like if you have a mixed and diverse team of people, you'll do better work. You'll get better, you get a much greater range of opinion. And it's like the healthiest dog you can own is a mongrel <laughs> because a mongrel's got mixed genes from all of these types of dogs. And so he's developed immunities and strengths against stuff. Whereas you get a pedigree that's just one breed all the time. And it's like it, they come with all kinds of sickness and, you know, genetic disorders. And so I think it's the same thing with the company. We look at a company in the same way. It's like you need variety to make it work. For but sure. we've got to work to develop that and bring more people into it. When you were talking about verticals like digital marketing, marketing, I actually realized I, I worked nine years at UMG. Mm. And a lot of the, it's true, a lot of the A&Rs are dudes. Uh, a lot of the promotions people are, are women. And there was an overall, it's not less women than, than male, but if you remove the junior employees, the interns, and you keep the senior staff, that's when it really counts. There yeah. were definitely more men, but the men tend to be, uh, they, they're, at UNMG in France when I was there, so 2004 to 13, I remember one woman A&R, not a junior scout, but a, a senior A&R. And that's actually the most shocking is certain very key decision making jobs uh, were, were left. And then you had uh, a bunch of like radio promotions uh, people, but the head of promo, the, 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 the VP was usually the guy. That has changed a lot. Um, I mean, I, th I think something else I'd say is I would love to see more, uh, a more, I, I, I feel like there are, you get women who are older with masses of experience who tend not to get invited to the table, even at things like panels at conferences and stuff like that, but I think can also just provide so much insight and wisdom I mean, frankly, to both genders, because there's an argument. There's just like someone with shit, shit loads of experience who's brilliant is can can impart can teach everyone a lot, you know. But I think it. I don't know. I just feel like the industry has a terrible tendency to like. This is an awful industry to grow old in anyway. But I think if you're if you're a woman <laughs> and you're you're past a certain age, you're in real trouble. You know, it's not. They do not you know, it's not an environment that's welcoming. And, you know, I think there's a, an inherent uh, thing where people dismiss older women much more quickly than they will dismiss older men. Uh, and I think that's a, a real shame. But I think equally, yeah, there's there's just, I mean, it's funny because, you know, I've got somebody involved on something recently based on the fact that they were older and had more experience and was sat with the manager going, this person has fucking forgotten more than I've ever learned. And that is the person you need on your team because this person is smarter than you and me combined. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that you hire cleverer people than you wherever you can. So get that person. And it's like, but you're fighting that thing of like, well, you know, there's an age thing there and are they, you know, are they hip and on it for now? And it's like, I think you're missing the point. It's that this person has learned so much, you know, that to, to not recognize that is ridiculous. And I think, you know, I remember Sylvia Montello saying this at Fast Forward uh, a few years ago, saying a similar thing, where she said, you know, even younger women in the music industry don't, you know, can be a bit dismissive of older women. And that needs to stop. You know, the older women have a voice and should be listened to. And I think there is a lot in that where it's like, you know, they are every bit as experienced and have every bit as much to impart, if not more, because of their experiences as a woman in the music business. Um And so they should be listened to and sought out and, you know, and, and, and just, you know, use. It doesn't happen more often. Um, that's a great segue to my, my last question. Um, we talked about more experienced people in the industry. If you were now um, looking at the 19 year old Darren, uh, full of hope in this world, <laughs> What would you tell him? What's the one advice you, you, you got maybe a bit later and you're like, ah, I wish I knew that before or the person you meet or uh, having role models or heroes or not having any of those or self-learning or trying to learn from others or uh, what's the one thing you, you wish you would have known a little bit earlier? Um, I mean, I think something I see a lot in music is that people don't have truly valuable things to offer 
you know, we see it, we're doing, we've done a lot of hiring and we're helping people hire at the moment elsewhere and stuff like that. Um, and you see this a lot where people sort of have very vague skill sets. And I think what I like in my team is we, we're all capable of rolling up our sleeves and running quite complex ads and rolling stuff out with, you know, Google Tag Manager and things like that. It's a, I mean, I know it makes, it makes me feel a bit old saying it, but it's like, you know, years and years ago, someone's dad would have said, look, you've got to learn a trade, you know, become a carpenter because the world will always need a carpenter or a bricklayer or stuff like that. And I think there's a lot of truth in it. And I think in music, there's probably a bit of that where it's like learn stuff that, you know, learn demonstrable skills, but also learn skills that you could apply elsewhere, whether that's becoming a developer. You know, if you have development skill, you might build a platform like Soundcharts. fintech or you know whatever but it's a it's a transferable skill and i think with what we do it's transferable and it was originally why we started working on different brands was almost to sort of say is this transferable you know if motive unknown at some stage wanted to exit music could it and, and the answer is yes easily you know we could we can do that because the skills we have can apply to anything you're trying to sell whether it's an album or a t-shirt or soap powder in theory so I think learning those skills and getting hands on with that stuff is is uh, is really important because it's one thing I see whenever I'm interviewing people is they don't they don't really seem to explain to me why they want this job in particular and what they've got to speak to that. Mm. And I remember when we hired uh, Hugo from my team, who's the guy I was saying before, you know, we interviewed him and, and my colleagues all turned around and just said, if you don't hire that guy, you are an idiot. And he sat there and just was like, here's all the reasons you should hire me and literally rendered us speechless. Because he's like, he's, he continues to be the most qualified guy in the company, to my amusement. He's done more Facebook and Google certificates and qualifications than anybody else. So he's got all of those professional qualifications. Um, so as good as, as good as it is to come and be the, the fan, um, I want to work in the industry. I'm a fan of music. I... I know how to record a bit, but I've done some management and I helped this friend doing a festival and, and I've signed this artist to my, uh, to my label. And, um, it's actually learn a craft, uh, like be, be the best digital marketer, be the best ear. If you want to be yeah, an A&R, maybe learn it, how to it be is that. It's, it's that an, an understanding that when, again, if, you know, if you're interviewing for roles and you're trying to get through that door, You've got to explain, you've got to present very clearly what value you have to that business. You know, it's like I've said to my staff before, you know, if you want a pay rise, you've got to give me a you know, really good case for it. Because you don't just get a pay rise for being here. I mean, you'll get ones for inflation adjustment and stuff. But if you want to be promoted and you want to get pay rises, you've got to explain what your extra value is. Why, why are you worth more to me now? Break that down. So if that's saying, well, it's because I'm now looking after all of this work and that's of a higher value than the work I did before. OK, well, now you've presented a solid argument because you're overseeing a value of work that's greater than it was previously. Therefore, you're more valuable. And therefore, yes, you probably do have a case of being paid for. But it's those things where I think in music particularly, if I had a penny for every guy that turns up being like, well, you know, I've, I've put on some gigs and I manage a band you've never heard of. And it's like, I mean, OK, but none of that really relates to what I need and this job spec, you know, it's just like doing some stuff in music is not good enough. You know, show me that you've got talent and acumen that I want to take and develop and further. And like when we hired Claire, who's our more recent hire, um, she's on like a fast track scheme to develop her to be a marketing manager. And we loved her because she just came in and was like pinging off all of this knowledge and understanding and insight and examples of what she'd done and it's the same thing where when she left we're like okay well we've got to hire her she's brilliant you know she's really great but it's those people that i think you know nail it in very clear terms here's why i am a value to you and if that means you've also learned skills that give you a value then i think that's the the you know you it it, it means that anyone trying to uh you know hire you and develop you as an employee you're talking to them in their language because what you're doing is saying, look, you're managing me. And as a manager, I understand that the value, my value to this business is this. But now I'm doing all these extra things. So now my value is that or whatever. And these are the skills that get you promoted in life and get you going places is like that keen understanding of what your value is to a business and, and where that, you know, that place within it. And I think very few people 
really look at that. And I think it, it makes them less likely to get hired and less likely to get promoted because they don't understand their value and they don't work to develop their own value. Um, so, yeah, I, I would probably say that because 19-year-old me was very idealistic and being like, yeah, I want to work in music. I love music. <laughs> and it's like, that's nice, but that means nothing. You know, what, what have you got? And when I got my first proper music job, marketing music, it's because I sat down and went, here's what I'd do, and this is why, and outlined it all. And they turned around and went, all right, great, you're the guy we want because you've got ideas and you've got a vision and that's what we need. Mm. I, I, I think you're completely right. I, I remember, um, I definitely don't anymore, though I would love to meet them, but I used to idealize some, some people who were like, like Jimmy Ivey and running Interscope, uh, no college. And then I, I started to read about those guys and I was like, fuck, they've all done so many things before they actually got their big gig. So Ivey was a sound engineer. He was actually in the studio recording a bunch of music. And the day yeah. that he started to sign people, he probably was extremely credible um, with a with a real voice uh, mm. saying that you should you know probably mix that a bit differently or the emotions that I feel from the song uh, everybody wants to be a uh, Lior Corin or Rick Rubin but nobody <laughs> neither you or I have created Def Jam uh, mm. yeah <laughs> like you know there's a point of like some people actually are uh, uh, multi-talented and don't have a precise expertise that's usually an expertise in itself. They are fast learners, business acumen, they understand situations and how to create value from them, and they have extremely good personal uh, relations and, and, and uh, um, uh, feeling for people. That in itself is a talent. But for the 99% mm. of like, people like you and I, it is about growing an expertise, and actually the expertise, you can usually bridge it to another, uh, another, another um, industry, like you with something else in music, and. Uh, maybe me with something else than the music as well. Um, cool. I've taken an hour and seven minutes of your time, and I have to take a year start to go to London. Um, <laughs> uh, last thing I wanted to make sure everybody does is subscribe to the Daily Digest from Motive Unknown. We'll link everywhere. We'll post about it so everybody makes sure um, they know what we're speaking about. Um, it was great finally having an hour with you, man. Yeah, sorry it took so long to get it organized. No, it's my uh, fault. But. My fault as well. <laughs> and I speak to you soon for sure. Great to chat. Yeah. Thanks, man. Bye bye. Speak soon. Bye bye.